James chapter five, because I think it was just relevant in light of a lot of stuff that's um, been taking place on the group. So, yeah, I think it was from here. Let's read the whole chapter. I won't, I won't teach through all of it, but let's just read it anyway. So James chapter five and verses one. Go to now, you rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. You have heaped up treasure together for the last days. Behold the hire of the labourers. You have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth, and the cries of them... Uh, the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. You have lived in pleasure on earth and been wanton. You have nourished your hearts as in the day of slaughter. You have condemned the just and he doth not resist you. Be patient therefore, my brethren, until the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husband man waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and have long patience for it until he received the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draws nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy, which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job, and you have seen of You've seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any oath. But let your yea be yea and your nay be nay, lest you fall into condemnation. And then this is the key passage here. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it should not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one converts him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Amen. So, I don't know, I think there were some things that have been spoken about in the, the group chat, which are false, so I just thought maybe I'll address some of them now. Um, sometimes I don't really like going back and forth on the group chat because it's just going to cause debate, and uh, I think we're not really called to debate one another, to be honest. So the first misconception I just want to quickly address was the idea, I think someone said that uh, that God doesn't use people to heal, and that's that's completely false. Uh, God does use people to heal, and we see that here in James uh, chapter 5, verses 14. It says, if anyone is sick among you, call for the elders of the church, let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. I, in fact, I can remember a time a number of years ago where I was battling with an addiction, and, you know, my mom took me to some elders, they poured oil upon me, upon my head, and they prayed for me. And I, I'm i pretty sure that within a month, I, I was able to overcome that, this addiction. And this was an addiction that I was addicted for about seven years. Okay, so even though I came into Christ, I stopped. And then I, I continue with, with that addiction, because addiction is a, is a serious thing. And God delivered me from that addiction after struggling with it for seven years and to this day if I were to even try and entertain that type of addiction I just I just possibly can't my body cannot take it at all so God really really delivered me and the way that God delivered me from that addiction was by my mom calling the elders of a church 
Um, and those elders, they prayed for me and I was completely delivered uh, from that. Thanks be to God. So God does use people, uh, just as the scripture says here, it says in verse 50, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Okay, so we serve a God, okay, that is not uh, nasty. We don't serve a God that is, is here to condemn you. Uh, we serve a God that's here to actually forgive you and to and to actually um, save save you from your sins. And verse sixteen says that look, you one way in which you can you can overcome your sins is by confessing your faults to one another and pray for praying for one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails. Okay, so that's just one thing I just wanted to quickly address. God does heal people. Um, God uses us to heal people. Uh, we may think that there are no prophets out there, there are no uh, evangelists out there, there are no pastors out there, but that's false uh, because in Ephesians chapter 4, it says that I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vacation where you've been called with all lowliness and meekness and long suffering, forbearing one another in love endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace so this is why i don't debate because the bible says you're supposed to endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace and as far as i'm concerned since i've been uh born again there's loads of people that have loads of different doctrines and i'm not going to try and fight people because they have a different doctrine to me but with the time the little time that god has given all of us because if we live to 80, 90, 100 years in the sight of God, that's still a little time, to be honest, especially when people used to live for 800, 900 years. We've been given, uh, if we're, by God's grace, we'll be, all be given 80 years, 90 years plus. But in that time that we've been given, we're not really being called to, to debate one another. So what we need to do is to endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit, the Holy Spirit, in the bond of peace. Okay, And that's why I earlier on I took the decision of just removing... Uh, somebody from the group because that individual was not endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit that individual had a had a spirit uh which wanted to cause strife and um and that wanted to cause division and wanted to cause arguments and that's not what we've been called to do okay because there is one body one spirit even as you are all called in one hope of your calling one lord one faith one baptism one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto everyone is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. And then we'll go into verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers. So there's some people that say, oh, but uh, that was only for the time uh, immediately after Christ died. He rose from the dead and he ascended into heaven. So these people are called what what theologians would call cessationists, and they believe that the spiritual gifts have ceased, and they also believe that um, that basically that we don't have these ministry gifts anymore, and that these this is a doctrine of devil, uh, doctrine of devils, and this is some of the stuff that had been mentioned on the group in the last forty eight hours. Okay, I, I think even implicitly, I don't even think explicitly, but implicitly. It was uh, um, it, they were basically preaching a cessationist message that there is no gifts of the spirit. There are no ministry gifts anymore. But if we keep reading, we'll see that this is false. This view is false for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So this is why God has given us uh, these type of ministers till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the son of God and unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, but a slate of man and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So this hasn't happened yet. We haven't all yet come to the unity of the faith. We haven't yet come uh, unto the perfect knowledge of the Son of God, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I don't think I have. So I presume, and I've met loads of people who haven't come to this measure as well. Uh, I've met a lot of people who are who are still children tossed to and fro. Um, so therefore, that leads me to believe that 
the body of Christ or these ministry gifts are still relevant for today. Okay, because essentially they are going to just be relevant until Christ comes back. Okay, perhaps in the kingdom, there won't be a need necessarily to be an evangelist or to be a pastor, perhaps in the kingdom, because in the kingdom we'll be kings and priests. But for now, we're still not, the kingdom has still not come onto the earth, okay? Um, yes, we could look at it and say, oh, the kingdom of God is within us. Yes, I agree. But if you're looking at the book of Revelation and looking at prophecy literally, and you believe that Christ is going to come back, then you must concede that the kingdom of God has not yet come onto the earth because the world is still in, in wickedness. Uh, the God of this world, is, uh, which is Satan and his angels, uh, you know, he's many of his wicked angels. Uh, they're still scheming. They're still deceiving. They're still plotting. They're still stealing, killing, destroying, murdering, lying. They're still doing all of these things. Okay, so the kingdom of God is not yet on the earth because when the kingdom of God comes on the earth, there's not going to be wars. Uh, there's going to be peace. There's going to be a prosperity. Uh, there's You're not going to see people begging on the streets. Uh, poverty will be eradicated, all those type of things, the wickedness that we saw on the earth, uh, the in, uh, the inequity, you know, the unfairness uh, that we see on the earth is not going to be like that when, when Christ rules. So uh, these, these posts, uh, the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, and then also the spiritual gifts such as healing, uh, prophecy, uh, interpretation of tongues, speaking in tongues, all those things will still be will still be exercised, okay, by the Spirit of God, okay. And any anyone that tells you otherwise, I just mark that individual as a as a, a liar, as a false teacher, uh, and somebody that actually teaches doctrines of devils. And we have to be careful because I think I don't know if it's in Second Timothy. Um, Not this one. Let me just write it down for things. The first Timothy chapter four. That the spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. And you see, it's it's very easy to depart from the faith. Okay. I've had people that have even been on this platform who have departed from the faith and they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. Okay, what is the power thereof? The power thereof is not some form of special holiness, is not some form of uh, special self-righteousness where you're keeping all the laws of, and commandments of God. That's not the power thereof. The power thereof is the faith, of, faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, when Paul is saying that they have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. He's talking about people that don't believe in the simple message of the gospel, which is that you are saved by Jesus Christ, by believing in him, by believing in his death, by believing in his resurrection, in his ascension, okay, that you become born again by believing this message, okay? As I said last week, that is what repentance means. Repentance means to have a change of mind, okay? It's not you, when you... When you repented and you believed in Jesus, it wasn't you that decided to somehow have a hatred towards sin. That wasn't you. That was the grace of God in you. That was the spirit of God that entered into you. That wasn't you. Okay, so to think that repentance is about, you know what, I'm turning away from all my sin. And, you know, now I hate all my sin. And that is proof of my salvation. That's not correct. If the reason why you felt that way, the reason why you felt like you needed to turn away from your sin, the reason why you hated all your sin is because when the spirit of God comes into you, it convicts you of your sin. OK, but what God had done is God, uh, God has chosen us to believe in this message. OK, but there are some people who have departed from the faith. They don't believe in this message anymore. OK, I've had people tell me, what do you mean that? You, all I need to do in, is believe in Jesus. That's not enough. I need to do this. I need to do that. And that is departing from the faith. Okay, now you're outside of grace. You put yourself back under the law. Okay, and the Bible says that he does not commit every precept in the law is cursed. Okay, not knowing that Jesus Christ became a curse for you on the cross so that you could now become a blessing, so that you can now be freed from that curse, which is the curse of the law. Okay, 
So departing from the faith, as much as I'm I'm bringing this uh, this scripture to show that look, some people are are talking about how there's no spiritual gifts. Ultimately, departing from the faith is when you you've lost your understanding of what salvation is. You've lost your understanding of your assurance. You know, I've had somebody even today tell you know they they put a message on on uh, you know an audio message and they were saying we don't know where we're gonna go. We don't know. You know, none of us have died. We might go to hell. We might go to heaven. And that's not the, that's not the message of the gospel. That's not the message of the faith. You should have an assurance that you are saved. You shouldn't be second doubting what God has done for you. Because if you don't have that assurance, that means you don't have faith. And if you don't have faith, then you can't please God. When we look at our forefathers, uh, when we look at the patriarchs that, and, and the matriarchs that came before us, they weren't, they weren't like super special in terms of their own self-righteousness. Nobody could be super special in terms of their own self-righteousness. Okay. They were special because they had faith. That's why in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, it's not talking about, when it's talking about all those men and women that were special in history, it's not necessarily talking about Oh, they did this great work. They did this fantastic work. It's it's all talking about their faith. It's talking about how Sarah had faith, even though she was she was old, and God told her that she was going to have a child. It talks about Noah, how there was a time when there was not in that time in the time of Noah there wasn't even rain, and yet God had told him that he was going to flood the earth, and he moved in faith. He built the ark. It talked about. How Abel offered up a better sacrifice through faith. It talks about how men, they destroyed armies. How men, they destroyed lions with their bare hands because of faith. Men's destroying giants. Men's living, men living in caves. Okay. Because of faith. So ultimately, Hebrews 11, 6 teaches us that without faith, it is impossible to please him. Okay. So... When it says some shall depart from the faith, let me tell you that the way to identify that is what what do they think salvation is? If they're saying that, look, you may go to hell, you may go to heaven, you don't really know, then how are you any different to other religious people? Because it's the same, same things that other religions say. Okay, we have to have that assurance. The Bible says that we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. That means the Holy Spirit will not leave you, won't depart from you. As I said last week, you can quench the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit remains in you. You're sealed by the Holy Spirit. You've been chosen by God. You, you've become a child of God. God is not going to now abandon you. Okay, Even, as we saw in, the, in the, the story of the prodigal son, that guy was living in sin, in sin for a season, but he came back to his senses and he went back to his father and his father embraced him and accepted him. He didn't speak evil of him. He didn't remind him that he had forsaken him. He didn't punish him. He embraced him and accepted him with open arms. You see, what, what actually happened to that prodigal son is that when he went back to the sin, it was the sin that punished him. Because that's what sin does. When you, when you live in sin, sin has a way of, of, of destroying you. Sin is very uh, destructive. And so when you go back to sin, and you but you've got God's spirit in you, you're a child of God, you come back to your senses. God helps you. And you ultimately come back to your senses. Even Samson, that Samson is an example. Samson was living in sin for a season. And what happens when you live in sin for a season? When you live in sin for a season, you leave yourself open to the devil. The devil is going to come and try and steal, kill and destroy it. But you see, even God had mercy on Samson. He didn't die prematurely until he finished the assignment. And then he cried out to God. He said, God, let your spirit come upon me again. And the spirit of God came upon Samson again. And God still used him. Okay. So when we see wickedness around in the world, it's not that God is there scheming wickedness. That's not the nature of God. It's the fact that we choose to entertain sin. And it's the fact that when we choose to entertain sin, our spiritual uh, armor is compromised. And we're not battling against flesh and blood. We're battling against very intelligent beings. Okay, we need to understand this, that what we're battling with, we're battling with 
spirits that are very ancient. We're ba we're battling with with some spirits that that are uh, that were either around the time of Noah. Okay, when we're talking about demons. Okay, because demons are the the disembodied spirits of giants. Okay, when Jesus was casting out demons, that's what he was casting out. But even above that, and and actually scarily, um, although we're not scared because we're in Christ, but just to bring light to what we're battling with, even much above that is that you're battling against angels. And these angels, as I said, are ancient. It's, these angels are, well, some of them were there before God even made Adam, before God made man. So we're not battling with something that is primitive. We're not battling against something that is religious. We're battling against very intelligent beings. So when things happen in our lives that are not positive, we cannot blame God. Because as I said, I mean, you look at the example of Samson. Wasn't Samson anointed? Wasn't Samson, couldn't Samson kill a bear? Couldn't Samson kill uh, hundreds of Philistines by himself? Wasn't he, he was clearly very anointed. And yet look at ha what happened to him. He got his eyes uh, taken out. Okay. He got put into the house of his enemies. They were mocking him. They were throwing things at him. They were spitting on him, laughing at him. So if that can happen to Samson, then we have these type of stories just to warn us that we need to be very diligent in our lives. Okay. And the way that we do that is number one, by having faith. That's always the foundation. But then number two, practicing some of these spiritual exercises, praying, fasting. Okay. Which, lead, which will lead me on to what I was preaching about last week praying in tongues because praying in tongues is a powerful way to build up your spirit okay remember greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world so when you look at paul who wrote in ephesians chapter six that we wrestle not against flesh and blood paul was paul was doing great damage against these spirits okay because paul can go into a region i mean I don't know if we've got time, but let me just give you a few few examples of what Paul could do through the Holy Spirit. Okay, because I, I don't bring up all of this to scare us. I bring this up to encourage us. I bring this up, number one, to show us what we're, we're fighting against. To, to succeed in warfare, you need to know who your enemy is. Okay, if, I don't, if you don't know who your enemy is, then what, what are you really engaging in? Because your enemy knows who you are. Your enemy can monitor you. Your enemy knows your star. The enemy knows and the enemy knows a lot about you. Okay, the enemy is always watching his enemies. He's spying. Okay, we don't even know that they're spying and they're spying. Okay, they're watching you. So you they they are they they're taking notes. They're observing. They're studying you. They're studying us. So the reason why I mention this and I bring it to light is because we also need to know who our enemy is. And I think we've simplified it and said, oh, it's just Satan, it's just Satan. Satan is one of them. And indeed, maybe he's the principal one. He seems to be the principal one. But there are many of them. Okay, let me just give you scriptures just to show this before we come to Acts and we see some of the works of Paul. But let me give you some scriptures. Revelation chapter 12. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. Okay, so dragon being Satan. And it says here, dragon fought and his angels. So the dragon has other angels as well. Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25, verses 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Okay, so that's what Paul is mentioning um, when he talks about uh, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, 
against principalities, okay, in high places. And the reality is these angels, uh, you you could have seen one of them. You just wouldn't know. That's just a reality. You could have seen it would have looked human to you. It wouldn't have had wings. <laughs> it wouldn't have had, you know, we have this, this, uh, this perception of how an angel looks. Okay, angel, angels, they look like men. Okay, they're a different type of species and they are superior to men. Okay, according to the book of Hebrews, book of Hebrews, it says, it says, and again, when he bringeth in the first begotten in the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he saith, who make of his angel spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. So we read that and we say, oh, angels are spirits, so they're invisible. Well, whenever we're introduced to angels in the Bible, they're not invisible, they're visible. Okay, it says, but to which of the angels said he at any time, sit thou on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Look, Jesus, Jesus is now a spirit. Okay, but when Jesus Christ came, um, he he had a different type of uh, you know, he had a he still had a physical body, it was like a spiritual type physical body, okay, because he could still eat, but Jesus is a spirit now. So it says here, Hebrews 2, verses 6, but in one certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crowned him with glory and honor, and did set him over the work of thine hand. So, so man is lower than the angels in its capabilities. Angels ostensibly they they can live uh for for essentially eternal eternity uh they have spiritual bodies but they can eat um some of them do use vehicles okay that might sound crazy but when you when you hear of technology like ufos you'll be surprised it's probably an angel inside of it um but when we're introduced to angels you see them they're physical okay they okay angel came down uh I think in Genesis chapter 18 to, to greet Abraham and Sarah and they fed them. It says, and the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre and he sat in the front door at the heat of the day and he lifted up his eyes and looked and lo, three men stood by him. So these, these were clearly angels and these were the angels that went to in the next chapter where what about Lot and is it Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah? And those men that came to save him were angels, but the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, they saw them and they beheld them that they were beautiful and they sought to rape those, those men. Okay. So there's a lot more I could tell you about how these angels looked, but I, I don't think it's relevant for today, but yeah, they're around. Sometimes I think in the book of Hebrews, it says uh, we should entertain strangers because sometimes you might even entertain angels unaware they might come with a blessing <laughs> they might come with a gift to give you maybe a spiritual gift and so it's good to entertain them to be so essentially be kind to all people you don't know who you're talking to so they were they're around us okay but in the midst of that the bible says that we're seated in heavenly in heavenly places in christ so we have uh the authority to do great things okay with not only by ourselves, obviously with the work of the Spirit, but also uh, with God's angels that he has also assigned for us. And we see this in the life of Paul, the ministry of Paul. In Acts chapter 19, it says, And this continued by the space of two years, so that all that were, all that they that which dwelt in Asia heard the word of God, Jesus, both uh, Jews and Greeks. So Paul preached so much in two years that a whole entire region uh, a number of countries heard the word of god through one man and god wrought special miracles by the hands of god okay you see what the devil wants you to believe is what some of them what some of the guys were, were mentioning on the group chat this last two days they want you to believe that god doesn't do miracles they want you to believe that god doesn't raise up prophets they want you to believe that God doesn't heal the sick, but it's a lie, okay? The same spirit of God that used Moses to part the Red Sea, okay? The same spirit of God 
that used David to destroy a giant is the same spirit that was in operation in Paul. It's the same spirit that's in you today. It's the same spirit that Jesus said that he that believeth in me will do my works and greater. Okay, so God is still in operation, okay? But we have to seek him. We have to be used by him, okay? We have to go out there and make ourselves available in, in one way or the other, okay? To be used by the spirit of God. I think the spirit of God wants to move, but I think we have to make ourselves available in order for him to move. In the book of Isaiah, we see, I'm going to come back to this, but in the book of Isaiah, we're given a glimpse into the, the strength of the Lord. Okay, let me read for it quickly. It says, in the year that King Isaiah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his robe filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. Okay, so it's, it's my belief that Satan is a, is one of these type of seraphims. So Satan is quite a high-ranking, uh, it's a high-ranking angel. A seraphim is, is basically like a snake. It's like a, it's, it's, it literally means a fiery serpent. Okay, that's what a seraph is. So it's, it's a type of serpent-like angel. Okay, and I believe Satan is one of these type of, of spirits. <clears throat> Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hands, which he had taken from the tongues of the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this have touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. So can you see, even in this, in this message, in this vision, can you see that it's all about the grace of God? Hey, I, Isaiah was standing before the Lord, and he, he was looking at his own righteousness. He was thinking, oh man, I'm, I'm done for. Maybe now it's judgment time, and I know that I've, I've been living in sin, and now my eyes have seen the Lord. This is not going to end well. But this, this passage shows us the mercy and the grace of God. Okay, God sent the angel to purify him. Okay, and immediately once he touched his lip, he said, your sin is purged. Your iniquity is taken away. This is talking about the effect that Jesus Christ has had in our lives. When we accepted Jesus Christ, okay, our iniquity, in, this is in the spiritual realm. Maybe when Isaiah came back from this vision... He was still battling with sin from time to time. But when something is settled in the spiritual realm, it's going to manifest eventually in the physical realm. And for many of us, I believe all of us who are in Christ, a similar encounter to what Isaiah experienced here has happened in our lives. And we're yes, we're battling with sin. Yes, we're battling with different things. But just understand that you, all you need is faith and God will perfect that which concerns you. OK, there's no man in the Bible, no woman in the Bible that was perfected in one day. There's nobody that once they believed, they just suddenly became this wonderfully holy saint and they had no blemish. They had no spot. It's something that God does through you over a period of time. OK, it's him that does the work. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I here I am, send me. So look, this is what the Lord is looking for. The Lord is looking for people who he can send. Okay. And Isaiah responded to this commission. Isaiah responded to this call from the Lord. So I'm of the opinion that when we make ourselves available, in much the same way God used Isaiah mightily, God can also use us mightily. Now, Paul is one of those who responded to that call. So that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons and the diseases departed from them and the evil spirits went out of them. Okay, so this is just an example of some of the mighty works that God used Paul to accomplish. Okay, even though, as I said, his enemies were many, not only here with, with human beings, 
But as he said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. He's, and many of his enemies were spiritual. Angels. Okay. How do I know? Even Paul mentions that his enemies were angels. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. It says, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was sent to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Let's break down these words. So, messenger. So he says, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan. So he's very specific of who, what the thorn of the flesh is. So messenger, if we go and check the Greek, this is what the Greek is. Strong's G32, Angelos. 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 What's an angelos? An angelos is an angel. Okay. This is the issue with some of these translations. Sometimes they, they don't want to be as explicit as they could be. They should have just put angel, <laughs> but they decided to translate as messenger. So sometimes you have to you have to look at the words. Okay, because you read messenger of Satan, you will just think, okay, maybe that was just a person that was on assignment sent by the devil. But it's very clear that when you look at the Greek, it's angelos, it's angel. And we've just read that. In two places that Satan has angels that work with him. So it says, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. So we'll just check what buffet means. So buffet means to strike with the fist, to give one a blow with the fist, to maltreat, to treat with violence. Okay, so he doesn't really specify the exact nature of this encounter. But he, he shows us that it was severe because he says, for this thing... Okay, so this is something that made him feel very uncomfortable because he says, for this thing, I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. So there was an angel who, that was harassing him. And he discerned. See, when you're, when you're not in the spirit, you just think that it's a person. You just assume it's a person. But Paul was in the spirit and he had discerned that this, this agent that had seen him Deliver many people and bring them to Christ. This angel was not happy. This angel, this angelic angel agent was not happy. And Paul by the Spirit could discern that no, this is not an ordinary, this is a this is an angel. This thing here that is harassing me, in whatever nature it was, again, he doesn't specify, this thing was was hindering him to the extent that Paul was praying and fasting and saying, God, please let this thing just leave. You know, as much as I want to serve you, this thing is really, really affecting me. It's really hampering me. It's really causing me pain. And then verse 9, he says, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. This is Jesus speaking. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will, I will rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Hey, what? Why is this? What is the context of this? Paul was talking about how he had seen many visions, how he'd been taken into heaven, how he saw many, how he had many angelic encounters, he saw paradise. And these things naturally puffed him up. These things naturally made him feel important. They made him feel somewhat proud. Okay, and so what he understood is that this calamity was coming upon him to humble him because it's in a place of humility it's in a place of dependence on God where we're at our, at our strongest in terms of spirituality. So sometimes things come into our lives, pain, afflictions, grief, all these type of things may come into our lives for a season, but they're only there to make us strong so that we can we, we, we resort back to God. We depend on God. Now, for those who are not called of God, that's why we see some of these people, they depart from the faith. We see that some of these people start to, to complain. We see that some of these people start to point fingers at, at other Christians. They start to point fingers at God. You see, sometimes when these people are pointing fingers at you, when they're frustrated with you, you don't understand. They're frustrated with themselves. They're frustrated with God. They may not tell you, but for them to come against the body of Christ who have done them no harm, that means they're frustrated with God. It's just like when Paul was persecuting the church. 
Jesus appeared to him and said, why are you persecuting me? Okay. So don't take, don't, don't be offended. Don't take it personally. If, some, if you're in the right, you're following Christ to the best of your ability. You believe in the gospel. You're trying to do right. You're not perfect, but they come at you. They're coming at you because they're coming at God. They're frustrated. They might be going through an affliction. And rather than use that affliction as a, as a tool to get closer to God, to pray, to become consecrated, they're using it as an excuse to point the finger. They're using it as, a, as an excuse to get angry with others. And God is not happy with that. We saw that in Exodus, when people were doing that, they were in the wilderness, they, they would consume, they would destroy it. And they eventually went back into idolatry. They went back into serving other gods. So please, none of you here, if somebody's saying that they would rather join this other religion or they'd rather join that religion and they're, and they're saying, oh, it's because other Christians, ignore that. Because for me as a Christian, I'm, I'm not even really focusing on what other people are doing. And that's just me being honest. If, if there are people in my life that I'm called to bless, of course, let me help them. Let me edify them. But on a day-to-day -day basis, I am trying to work out my own salvation with fear and trembling. And if there's a Christian that is doing wrong, okay, if that Christian is, is somebody that I have a relationship to, then as we read in James chapter 5, it says that save somebody from that position and then you're going to save that person from a multitude of sins. If that person is in your sphere of influence, then of course... But for me to go to random people that I don't know, for me to start rebuking random people that I don't, I don't think that's my responsibility. I don't think that's any one of our responsibilities to be rebuking people that are on TV, pastors, but we call them prosperity pastors. We say that this, we say that that. I, who are we to, to, to do that? Okay. We're supposed to focus on ourselves first. Make sure that we're right with God. Make sure that we're strong spiritually. Okay, because the things that we read Paul, that Paul was doing, where he said that they were aprons and he will get the aprons and, and people will be healed from different types of diseases. That would not have been possible had he not had a, a strong relationship with God first. So you need to have that strong relationship with God first so that when you're speaking, you're speaking through the spirit of God. When you're not close to God, you're just speaking through the flesh. Those people that were speaking on, on the chat, they were speaking through the flesh. They were not speaking through the spirit of God. They were speaking through the flesh. And it, it, to be honest, it's actually quite obvious. It was quite obvious to tell that. Okay. So focus on yourself before you start rebuking others. Especially it says in Matthew that, you know, you, you go to your brother, you're judging him. And you're saying, oh, look, there's a, there's a, there's a speck of, of wood in your eye, but you don't know you have a log in your own eye. Take out the log first so that you can see your brother clearly before you go around judging others. Ultimately, God is the one that will judge one another. People say, oh, but the Bible says in Corinthians we're going to judge angels. Yes, we're going to judge angels, but it doesn't mean we're going to judge one another. We're not here to, we're not going to end the kingdom to come. I'm not going to be judging Rob. Rob is not going to be judging me. Okay, Jesus will judge us accordingly. And then when we're given our authority, when we're made kings and priests, then our, those wicked enemies that we battle with today, we will judge them. Okay, we will go through a judicial process according to how God sees fit. And we're going to judge them according to the books, according to his law. Okay, and then we will condemn them accordingly. But it's not our responsibility to be judging one another to that degree. If a brother or a sister has made a mistake, then this is what we're called to do. Galatians chapter 6. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Okay, so meekness means like humility and gentleness. Considering yourself lest thou also be tempted. So if somebody has made an error, they're living in sin, it's not our place, especially on an open platform, it's not our place to start condemning them, to start rebuking them. Okay? What we ought to do is in kindness, is in love, 
speak to them. And I'm very happy, actually, because when we saw that this in the last few days, everybody that spoke up did so in this ex in this precise way, in a spirit of meekness. We didn't rise up to the challenge. We didn't fight. We didn't hurl insults. We all spoke in a spirit of meekness, which, which to me is great. It means that the spirit of God is mature in every single one of us. Because maybe in the past, we wouldn't have been like that. Maybe we would have hurled insults back. Maybe we would have got offended, we would have got angry, but none of us were like that. We all understood that something is going on that maybe we don't understand. Something needs to be done. We need to intercede. We need to pray on, on, on people's behalf. And we need to continue to show love, kindness, because that's how we bring people closer to Christ. It's through love and it's through following peace with all men. Okay, it's, it's from being harmless as a dove, wise as a serpent. Okay, it doesn't matter. They may think you're weak, but you know you're not weak because you didn't rise up to the challenge. Don't let your pride come in and say, okay, I need to show that I'm strong. No, be like a dove. Okay, but inside you're a serpent. Okay, you're wise, you're smart. And a serpent isn't necessarily a bad thing. Okay, <laughs> I've shown you about because someone may say oh what does it mean be wise like a serpent serpents are all evil hey look serpents some serpents are wicked some serpents are good we've seen in the uh, in isaiah chapter six those angels that were there the seraphim do your your own do uh, your research in uh in your own time uh, but a seraph is a is a serpent-like creature okay those were serpent-like angels that were there that isaiah saw moses even put up a serpent <laughs> In the wilderness, a brazen, a brazen serpent, and actually helped to restore people and heal people. Okay, so things are not evil in them in of themselves. Okay, uh, all of God's creatures are, 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 you know, He created them for a purpose. But some of them are evil in the same way that some humans are good, some humans are evil. Okay, so we need to be wise like serpents. Okay, bide your time. Okay, serpents are very patient. Okay, serpents. When they catch their prey, they don't go in immediately. They can stand there for hours waiting for the perfect opportunity to pounce and to catch the prey. So we as, as Christians, we have to be very patient. We read in James 5 that we have to be patient like Job. Okay, He went through a lot, but he was patient. And that's part of being wise, like a serpent. Thinking before you speak not uttering everything that's in your mind. I've seen that in the, you know, in the last few days. People uttering what's in their heart, people uttering what's in their mind. The, the book of Proverbs teaches us that that is not wise. The Bible says in Proverbs, it says a fool utters all that is in his heart. Okay, we have to, we have to be discreet. Know when to speak. The Bible says there's a time to speak, there's a time to keep silent. It's all part of wisdom. Okay, so we'll close on, on that note. Um, I'll just quickly read through the messages. I appreciate we didn't really talk much about tongues, um, but maybe what we'll do next week, God willing, we will talk more about tongues. Um, one last thing before we close, I'll read the comments, but one thing about the tongues is have faith that the tongues that you're speaking are from God, because in much the same way, people are going to discourage you that the spiritual gifts are not operating today. People are also going to discourage you about speaking in tongues. And I just want to say that from my experience, having done it, it, it does strengthen me spiritually. I can feel it even in my body. I can even feel the anointing get stronger upon me after I'm praying in tongues for a period of time. And when you pray in tongues, you need to... You need to do it for a period of time. It's not a case of uh, one minute or two minutes. Okay, and praying in tongues is good because sometimes we don't know what to pray. There's only so much we can pray. Prayers longer than five minutes, we're likely to be repeating ourselves, okay, with the same prayer points. So when you feel that need to pray longer, it's good to pray in tongues for a period of time. You'll feel stronger. So I'll leave you on that. We'll just read through the, the messages. Uh, Rob says, Lucifer was a high-ranking angel. Along Michael and Gabriel. Des says, I think 
that this was one of the main roots of condemnation of myself. I felt like when key characters in the Bible repented, we never really hear of them doing it again. Well, look, some some key characters, you say that they repented, but they were living in a, a, a long period of time where they weren't repenting. So it's just the same as, as anybody else. If you David would not have repented after he killed a man and he was he was living in adultery. He was, you know, he, he was, took another man's wife and he was trying to pretend like nothing had happened. He didn't tell anybody. Okay, but God saw it and God sent the prophet and rebuked him. And he and his son, his first voice, well, the first son that he had with the woman, Bathsheba, died as a result. When that happened, I mean, if you're a father and you get one of your sons gets struck down and you don't repent, then you're a bit of a fool. Because for that to happen, the prophet comes to you and tells you that, look, I'm coming as the oracle of God and, and we saw what you did. And God has sent me to condemn you, to rebuke you. And actually your son's going to die within the next seven days. David actually took it seriously anyway. He started to fast, and, but the baby still died. So of course you're going to repent in that circumstance because the fear of God is going to come upon you. And you're going to know that if you're going to continue walking in that way, then you're next. God is likely to do the same thing to you. So we look at that and we think, oh yeah, David just repented like a day after he did it. No, it was a very long period of time. He was He was going to continue to live that way. But God had mercy upon him and chastened him so that he could get right. Okay, so in, yeah, sometimes it's good. It's good to get right with God before before that happens, before you feel like he's really chastening you. Okay, but just because the Bible doesn't tell us that, okay, they repented, they didn't do it again. Just because we don't hear of that doesn't mean that that was the case. Sometimes I'm sure they were still battling. These were, these were human beings, Brother Desmond. They're people like us. They're not, these are not like special type of, of, like spirits or like special creatures or like special species these were these were human being people that as i said earlier on that found favor because they they believed in god and his messages and his promises and you can become like them okay when you have that faith in god almighty and his son god sees you the same as them even if you slip up even if you you make mistakes even if you fall into back into sin god still sees you as his son He's willing to forgive you. So it says, but sometimes I forget they are human. Okay, you said that, but, but sometimes I forget they are human. So, so maybe they made a mistake again here and there, but were freed at the end of it. <laughs> Brother, when, when you get to a certain age, you don't have that desire to sin <laughs> or so, certain sins anyway. You know, that's why the Bible says flee youthful lust. Many of the sins that, that, that people, you know, young people, believers are battling with our, our um, youthful lusts okay now god will deliver you deliver you from youthful lust you won't remain a youth for, for the rest of your life i thought i had to be perfect after repentance see that's a false doctrine brother that's the um departing from the faith which i said earlier on that um it, it, that the spirit saith that in the latter days many shall depart from the uh, from the faith okay um or else I was a fake Christian and had something wrong with me. But thanks for reminding me. Yeah, and the devil wants you to believe that if you're not perfect, you can't share the word of God. Who wrote most of the Psalms? Like 95% of the Psalms? Well, probably not 95%, but he wrote a lot of the Psalms. King David. And David, look at, look at I, I mean, I read this guy's life and I'm like, people read David's life as if it wasn't actually real. Like this man, to impress his to impress his king at the time, he served under Saul, and to get his uh, to get Saul's daughter. David killed like a hundred men, and he he circumcised all of them, and I'm sorry, this is quite graphic, but he circumcised all of them, hundred men, dead men, and he brought their foreskins to the king. Does this sound like a nice type of guy? Let's just be real. It, to me, that doesn't sound like a traditional sort of nice, holy looking guy. You know, this guy killed another man to take his wife. And the man already had like six wives already and a number of concubines. David had a lot of women. David could have had any woman he wanted in the whole kingdom. He had loads, but he took another man's wife. So... 
that alone should show us that even if you're battling with something, it doesn't mean you can't be bold in the Lord. It doesn't mean you can't share the word of God. It doesn't mean you can't preach the word of God. The people that were chatting on the on the on the group chat were trying to make it out like, oh, we're being hypocrites because you know we we still battle with sin, so therefore we shouldn't be preach sharing gospel or we shouldn't be sharing uh, uh, scriptures. That's false. Okay, even if you're battling with something. You still need to represent Christ. You need to represent God. Don't quench the Holy Ghost. Don't let the devil con condemn you into believing that, oh, because you're, you're battling with something, you're not worthy. Okay, you, are, you have been made worthy by what Jesus Christ has done for you. When you have faith in Christ, you are made the righteousness of God. You are considered worthy. You are considered righteous. You are considered sanctified. You are considered holy. You considered a child of God. The moment you repented and you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you made him your Lord. You baptized in his name. You you had your name uh, written in the book of life. You had your 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 roots grafted into the promises, grafted into the covenant of Israel. Okay, you are righteous. Okay, you even if you're battling with those things, continue to proclaim Christ. Okay. Don't don't be that Christian at the end of your life. You're gonna look back and say, you know what? I wasted a lot of years. Could have served the Lord. Could have done more, but because I was condemned, and you think you know, Christ does not condemn you. The Spirit convicts you. Who condemns you? The devil. Satan condemns you. So when you feel condemnation, know that it's not God. It is the devil. Conviction. Okay, you've done a sin. You feel like, oh, that wasn't right. I need to stop doing that. That's conviction. Condemnation is what I'm not good enough. I'm going to hell. I can't preach the gospel. I'm, I'm just so unholy. Okay, that's condemnation. That's satanic, okay? Amen. Moses wrapped up a serpent around the cross as a sign. I have posted in the group pics, videos of angels. Please roast them again. Thank you for this time worth more than silver and gold. Hallelujah. Um, praise God. The overview of Israel in the desert for 40 years is a picture of the nature of a man with God and without God making mistakes and being corrected as well as those rebelling and being swallowed up by the ground. God purged them all, purged them of all rebellion before they could enter the promised land. Even Moses was banished from entering in because of he disobeyed God. Hallelujah. David took another man's wife in the time of war. That's very true. When he should have been at the head of his army. Do not come into agreement with condemnation. Amen. Hallelujah. And that's actually, yeah, that's true. Time he should have been praying. He decided to relax. There are seasons in our lives where we should be praying. There are seasons in our life where we should be engaging in spiritual warfare more than other seasons. That was a season when David should have been in warfare. He decided not to war, and then we saw what happened, okay? Hallelujah. Thank you guys so much for tonight. Um, let's just close. Um, Father, we thank you, Lord, for today. We just thank you, Lord, for your spirit. We thank you, Lord, for this study. We just pray, Lord, that as we sleep, we will sleep safely, and that you would visit us, Lord, uh, that you would continue to strengthen us and give us wisdom, Lord. And I pray that you protect us uh, from all of our enemies, Lord, and that we would prevail in every situation that we're in, that you would send your heavenly host to do battle on our behalf and to minister unto us, Lord. And ultimately, Lord, we want to pray for everyone, Lord, even the brothers that couldn't make it today and sisters that couldn't make it today. Uh, we also pray for, uh, for Ryan. Lord, we pray that if there's anything... Uh, in his body that is not of you, that you would heal him. Almighty God, you heal his mind also, mm -hmm. Lord, and that you would heal anybody else, Lord, in the on the platform that needs your healing, that may have not even uh, voiced it, may have not even uh, confessed that they had issues. Lord, you see all of us and you know our needs, Lord, so we just pray for mercy uh, for every single one of us, for none of us are righteous, Lord, but we just pray for mercy, Lord, even tonight. And Lord, we just want to take this opportunity, Lord, also, just to thank you uh, for mm -hmm. all that you've done, to thank you for our lives, to thank you for one another, uh, to thank you for your spirit, and to thank you, Lord, also for salvation mm -hmm. and for the many things that 
Lord, the things that you've prepared for us, the things that you're going to uh, you're going to bring before us, the things that uh, you're going to give us so that we can also bless others around us, Lord. So we just we give you all the thanks in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Good night, guys. God bless you. God bless you.